The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of Oshkosh Media, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. Manitowoc G.A.R. 
from beginning, from first meeting to last meeting, from 1880 to 1881 to 1933. Every, every minute was in there, very telling. Uh, ironically, that should never have existed. Posts of the GAR were required to turn their minutes into the state uh, department when they, when they disbanded. But fortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, when the last uh, veteran from Manitowoc passed away, uh, the last member of the GAR, nobody realized that you had to turn the minutes in. So they were eventually donated to the historical society where they sat on the shelves for almost 70 years, kind of on notice, until I kind of picked them up. At that time, I put them into a book, The History of Horace Walker, uh, post-18 Grand Army of the Republic, 1881 to 1834. And the complete minutes are in there, and it, it, it's very telling. If you have any interest in the GAR, I also included in there a big section on the rituals and practices. And there were, I believe, 232 members of the Manitowoc Post over the ma many years. I included a history of each one of these <coughs> men, because each man was a veteran, so he had a, a veteran service record. So that's all included in the, in the book. Uh, that I put together on, on our local post. So just who were the GAR? Why were they called? <coughs> and what were they looking to do? The GAR, or we call them the Grand Army of the Republic, and we'll look at this picture first because we probably won't see it again on here. This is our Manitowoc post during their height. This was picture was taken about um, late 19, 1890s, the building they're standing behind is the Manitowoc, the old Manitowoc courthouse before the new courthouse was put together and built. They're actually standing at the back of the courthouse. The front is more decorative, but they're standing in the back. The flag is the post flag that they're, the man standing here is uh, James Anderson, which was <coughs> considered the founder. At this time, they probably had about 140 members. Um, they were a fairly large post, the GAR post for, for a <coughs> medium-sized town. The Grand Army of the Republic is a veterans organization. It was actually the first veterans organization in the United States. Uh, and they have been small get-togethers of revolutionary soldiers of uh, War of 1812, of uh, the Mexican War. But the Civil War veterans were the first ones to put an organization together that actually worked. The GAR, like I said, was the first organization they were put together to benefit, benefit uh, their fellow Civil War veterans as well as to acquire benefits for them and their families. Uh, the first GAR was established in Decatur, Illinois on April 6 of 1866. Now the reason we're doing this program tonight is last Wednesday was the 150th anniversary of the forming of the GAR, April 6, 1866, last Wednesday. Their structure was kind of as follows. Each, there was a national organization, and each, uh, the national organization had a commander, a senior vice commander, a senior vice commander, and then officers on down the line. The, it, that then went down into the state level where they were called state departments. It would have been Department of Wisconsin, Department of Illinois, Department of Ohio. And again, they had the structure of a commander, a, a senior vice commander, junior vice commander, and then again on down the line. And that went on down to local posts, such as Post 18 out of Manitowoc. Once again, they, they had a commander here, um, senior vice commander, um, junior vice commander, and down, on down the line. The Wisconsin Department of GAR was one of the first departments established in the United States. Because of our proximity to the state of Illinois, where the national was formed up. The um, Wisconsin Department was formed in uh, June of 1866, just two short months after the National was organized. By 1871, Wisconsin had 75 individual posts. 
around the United States, including the Manitowoc Post, which was Post 38 at that time. Unfortunately, the GAR was not supposed to be a political organization. Yeah, it, it, and that didn't happen because most of the people in charge of it were Republican. So those who were not Republican were not real happy campers. They often referred to it, instead of the Grand Army of the Republic, as generally all Republican. <laughs> <laughs> because of that, the organization basically disintegrated. It almost came to a crashing halt. By the year 1880, <coughs> only two of the original 75 posts in Wisconsin were still in existence. And only a handful of members, maybe 50 people in the whole state, 50 vet, Civil War veterans in the whole state were still members. And that wasn't just Wisconsin, that was nationally. An average of two, three, two to three posts per state nationally. So they came near to crashing and burning. Fortunately for them, in the year 1880, a couple guys in the city of Milwaukee had the brainstorm of having a veterans reunion. And they said, well, we're not gonna invite just the Wisconsin veterans. We're gonna invite everybody from the, uh, from the whole United States. Now, to be a, a member of the GAR, you had to be a union soldier, and you had to have an honorable discharge. So in 1880, when they established, when they put together this reunion, they figured, well, we can probably out of the whole United States get 10 to 20 thousand members. When the uh, reunion convened in June of 1880, over a hundred thousand veterans flooded the city of Milwaukee. <laughs> it was time for a veterans organization again. The GAR took advantage of this. The GAR had nothing to do with the reunion, but they stepped in and they took advantage of this. They started talking it up again, started talking to men to go back to their hometowns and reestablish GAR posts in their community. Mm -hmm. One of those men that was there, you want to go to the next slide? One of those men there was uh, James S. Anderson. Anderson was a Civil War veteran. He served with Company A of the 5th Wisconsin. He had come back from Anacock and went to uh, college in Appleton, got his degree, and came back to Manitowoc where he became an attorney. Uh, he was also a politician. He was a, a judge in Manitowoc for a number of years, and he also was at the state legislator. He, a uh, very well-liked individual, when he came back from that reunion in 1880, you had to have 10 men, 10 veterans, to form a, a GAR post. He was able to, within a couple of months, get 22 men together. And, you want to go to the next slide? These 22 men met for the first time on April 18, 1881, where they elected Anderson as their first <coughs> commander. A month later, the Department of Wisconsin sent a representative down with their charter, and they were chartered as post 18 of the GAR from Wisconsin. You can see the signatures of the 22 men that uh, were the original charter people that signed it. Unfortunately, this is not the original charter. The original charter was lost in a fire when the GAR post was renting a hall above a tavern in Manitowoc, and the tavern caught fire, <coughs> and they lost pretty much all their records, except for the, the minutes, which were at the secretary's house, fortunately. The GAR issued a, a, a new charter, and I don't think each of the individual members signed it. I think somebody just signed their names to it. This is in the possession of the Manitowoc County Historical Society right now, as part of their, part of their records. Um, in addition to uh, being designated as post 18 of the GAR from Wisconsin, it was traditional for a GAR post to take the name of a Civil War hero. You might have like General Grant Post 9, uh, General Sherman Post uh, 27. <coughs> Manitowoc chose to take the name, you want to go to the next slide, of this gentleman right here, Captain Horace M. Walker. Before the war, Walker was a prominent Manitowoc attorney 
when the war came about, he raised, basically raised, uh, I shouldn't say he raised it, uh, was instrumental in helping raise the first company to leave Manitowoc. Uh, unfortunately, he was killed in action on um, November 7, 1863 at the Battle of Rappahannock Station, Virginia. Uh, his body was uh, packed up along with his sergeant and sent back to Manitowoc where they were buried in Evergreen Cemetery. So his grave is still <coughs> prominent in Evergreen Cemetery. So the post took, officially took the name as Manitowoc Post 18, uh, Man Forrest Walker Post 18 Grand Army of the Republic. Now to become a member of the post, you, weren't, you couldn't, couldn't just go in the door and put your application in. You had to be voted in by the members. So what was traditional, you could come to the meeting, but you had to sit in an outer room, and then the members would take a vote. And they, they kind of stole this practice from the Masons. They had a wood ballot box, and they went around to each member. <coughs> Can you give me a call for us? <coughs> they went around to each member and uh, gave them two marbles the white marble and the black marble. And they then came around with the ballot box, and if you liked the guy and you wanted to be a member of your post, you put the white marble. If they didn't particularly care for the guy, you could basically vote him out by putting the black marble in there. Well, probably 95% of the guys that, uh, especially in the Manitowoc post, thank you. In the Manitowoc post, uh, were voted in, but there were some that that were not voted in. There was a Captain Charles uh, Schmidt, I believe it was, from the 26th Wisconsin. Must have really ticked some of his men off because when it came time to vote, he was kind of like half and half black marbles and half and half. And you only had two black marbles in your road anyway, so <laughs> apparently he was not well liked. Um, once you were voted in, then you still had to be inducted into the, into the ceremony. And to do this, the room you're waiting in, you had two guards there holding muskets with bayonets, kind of keeping an eye on you. And let's say you were voted in, they, the uh, sergeant of arms would come into the room and he would blindfold you. And he would then lead you into the meeting room where you would knelt down in front of the, uh, the assembly. And you you made you swore an oath at that time, which is, do you s solemnly swear in the presence of Almighty God and these witnesses, your former companion in arms, that you will never, under any pretense, nor for any purpose whatever, make known the secrets of this encampment, that you will never make known or cause to be known, either directly or indirectly, any of the passwords, grip signs or any information whatsoever by which any of the hidden mysteries of this work or rituals of this band of comrades known to the uninitiated. It goes on and on and on. Um, now we, we may think that is unusual, but it's really not. Because I belong to the VFW American Legion Vietnam Vets and basically the same procedure is done for these groups. So. What the GAR established is, was passed on to uh, future veterans organizations. So <coughs> once he, make, he swears to the oath, they'll come up and they take the blindfold off and he finds, and what's the next? He finds that he's kneeling before an open coffin. <laughs> <laughs> and as he looks up, the guys with the, uh, with the muskets and bayonets have the bayonets about two inches from his eyeball. Oh, Next slide. About well, that time he feels like this guy right here. He's wondering what in the world did I get myself into. So if he passes all of that, he, he becomes an official member of the post. But they held very, very staunchly to their rituals and practices. And again, a lot of these, they, they, they stole from the Masons and other groups other civic group, or groups that were around at the time, and there were quite a few of them. So they didn't really initiate these practices themselves, they just kind of, because they had members in the GAR that were Masons and members of the Outfellows, and they just kind of put it all together. That's the, the practices. 
Now we must remember that the GAR was primarily, primarily a paramilitary organization. That is, that their structure was based on the military that they once served in. For an example, in addition to their commander, senior vice commander, and junior vice commander, they also had an adjutant, a sar uh, surgeon, a quarter, uh, quartermaster sergeant, a chaplain, an officer of the day, and an officer of the guard. Now, if you disobeyed their rules, let's say you told somebody that was not a member some of the passwords or secrets or signs that they should not know because they were not a member, you could be court-martialed. And believe it or not, yes, both the AP and the Manitoba did court-martial some of their members. They actually convened a court-martial. Uh, the worst penalty that they could get is they were either completely banned from the GAR or they could be banned for a, a number of meetings. Um, in their minutes, they never did say exactly why their people were court-martialed. They just kind of kept that a secret. But they did say what the penalties were. And some, uh, there was at least one that was completely banished from the local board. Another one received uh, two or three meeting uh, suspension. In addition to the, to the court martial, if you uh, were moving to another city and you wanted to remain in the GAR, you could receive a military trans uh, GAR transfer, which would transfer you to the new post in the new city that you were moving to. If you felt that you were no longer, you want to bring up the next picture, if you were no longer wanted to attend the meeting, let's say you were older and you lived in the county and you couldn't make the meetings, but you didn't want to be booted out by them, you wanted to um, basically be honored by them, you could receive an honorable discharge from the GAR. They're saying that you don't no longer have to pay dues and you were a good faithful member of the GAR so we're saying we're releasing you from your bond in the organization. Their social events, when they got together after their meetings and uh, whenever, were called campfires because that's what they did when they were in service. In the evening they would sit around the campfires and sing their songs and uh, so they called their social, any social event was a campfire. What we call conventions, they call encampments, because again, that's what they did when they were in service. They set up their tents and they encamped. In the winter time, they would go into a winter camp or an encampment. So they called the, call these um, encampments. Their uniforms and ribbons, what I'm wearing tonight, is not the uniform of the GAR, because the GAR never had an official uniform. They felt that each member should be able to choose what he wanted to wear. So, but this was the favorite of most of the men, the double-breasted coat, the uh, hat, whatever style hat with the GR emblem on. If you wanted, you want to go to the next uh, slide? If you were from Manitowoc and you wanted to uh, really dress up for the uh, what they call Decoration Day, what we now call Memorial Day, you would go to the Old Horse and Company which was located on North 8th Street by the river uh, by Maritime Drive. The building is still there. It's now a bunch of apartments. But for $10 to $30, you could buy a nice double-breasted suit in the GAR style, even though that wasn't, uh, again, they never had an official uniform or an official hat. Upon induction into the GAR, each member received a membership medal. And tonight I'm wearing I want to go to the next slide. The GAR membership medal. I am wearing a GAR membership medal. This is an original medal that was issued to a Civil War veteran that was given to him upon his induction into service. You can still buy these. They sell them. You can get them on. I mean, they, you can't. They can't reproduce them anymore. By law, they can't reproduce them. But you can buy them on eBay for anywhere from fifty to uh, depending on. The, the rank of the person up to a couple hundred dollars. So you can, you can still buy the, buy the ribbons. They also had uh, a variety of other ribbons and medals when they attended their, their encampments, either a state encampment or the national encampments. Each one had an authorized um, medal that they could buy, or they could buy any number of other ones that were put together by vendors there. 
And they really love it. They love their ribbons and their medals. I mean, when they came back, they had screws on those things. And what they would do is that they would wear them for the next year. And then they would put them away and they would start over again the following year. And they had some really nice collections by the, by the time they were done. Uh, yeah. The eagle on top of that, does that mean something special? On top of here? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, the eagle doesn't, but the star on the bottom and the eagle were made, all made from captured, melted down, captured Confederate cannon. So it was really something special to the Union veterans when they got their medal because these were the cannons that they helped, that they helped capture. Mm -hmm. Now, by 1897, uh, <coughs> had started to thin a little bit. Out of the 22 original charter members, these are the nine members that were still left at the post. Some of them had moved away, other ones had pretty much given up and then quit, and still others had passed away. So, all the original 22. Here's some pretty notable characters in here. Um, that's James Anderson, a little, a little bit more by age now. Uh, the founder of the post and the first commander. The gentleman next to him is a man named James James Cumberlege. Very little known name in our area, yet he is buried in Evergreen Cemetery. If you ever go to King Veterans Home, there is a street named after him. Because he was one of the six original guys that were selected by the state GAR to pick the location of the Wisconsin Veterans Home. So in honor of that, they named a street after each of these six gentlemen. And that's James Cumberland. He was one of the six that picked King. It was a, a resort that had gone defunct. And they really loved it because it was on the water and had a number of cottages already and some around there were kitchen facilities. So they picked it up for a pretty good price. And if you've ever been to King, Wisconsin today, you know what it's turned into. It's a massive retire uh, not retirement home, but a veteran's home right now. Um, these were uh, that's by Wapaka. Yes, that's uh, this is that's in by Wapaka. Um, that's uh, one of Schmitz. He was a, a merchant in Manitoba. This guy back here is Fred uh, Versteady from Versteady's Drugs. If you're familiar with the drugstore in, in downtown Manitoba. Gentleman here with a with a really nice long beard is James uh, Noble. Uh, James Noble and his brother, William Noble, were both uh, charter members of the GAR post here in Manitoba. Uh, him and his brother are notable because uh, William was one of the 26 color sergeants picked to accompany Lincoln's body from Springfield, or from uh, Washington, D.C. to Springfield, Illinois. So he personally carried Lincoln's body when they, when, during the 13 different services that they had. Well, his brother is doing that. James here was back in Washington guarding the Lincoln conspirators. So both of them were, were very well known. Like I say, we had some pretty notable characters that were part of that post. Also in 1897, the local post decided as a group that they would attend the national encampment at Buffalo, New York. And uh, to attend that, they decided to go by boat. You want to put the next? Uh, this was an ad that was in our local paper. Uh, Captain Dick Neville here. He was uh, advertising for members of the GAR to take his boat from Manitowoc to Buffalo, New York. And he listed the, the fees included for to make the trip for fifteen dollars round trip. Uh, he succeeded because Manitowoc had a, a goodly number of men go on it. I'm assuming he probably made stops down along the line like Sturgeon Bay and then two rivers, Cheboygan and um, Fort Washington before he headed out to Buffalo, New York. Next uh, slide. Hi, well, are you recognize this gentleman? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah. Jeremiah Reardon. If you notice, he's standing at a railing because he's standing on the deck of the John W. Moore on the way to Buffalo. And you might notice that his sleeve here is empty. That's because he got a shot off at the bottle of Rosaka, if I remember right. It's, they amputated his arm, what, three times, was it? 
he's got a shot it off down here the first time they amputated and it got infected, so they had to cut it off again. It got infected the second time, so they cut it off right at the, if it had been the third time, he probably wouldn't have been in the picture anymore because there was nothing left to cut off at that point. Um, you can go to the next slide. This is Jeremiah, and I assume that's his wife, right? Mm -hmm. And daughter? Mm -hmm. And what relation is that to you? That's, uh, well, Jeremiah is the brother of my grandparents. Okay. And then uh, one of the girls, Mary, Nettie, married Mary Smalley, Mary Herschel Smalley. Herschel Smalley, mm -hmm. right. Uh, so this was also was taken on the deck that was up with John, uh, John W. Moore on the way to uh, Buffalo, New York. It was traditional for the men to take their wives and sometimes the daughters along to these encampments. One of the other stories about that trip was there was a gentleman a member of the post by the name of Edwin F. Cadell. And the group was standing up on the deck, and poor Edward, he took one too many steps backwards and fell into an open cargo hole of the ship. He went down, hit down two, uh, two stories below, killed him better than Dorney, or was going to be at the bottom of the deck. Now you would think, you know, if that had been us, we would probably felt bad, and we'd pack him up, and we'd all take him back to Manitowoc for burial. But you gotta remember, these were some really hard, I mean, they had been through the Civil War. They had seen their comrades shot, they had held them in their arms when they died. They'd seen their, their friends die from different diseases. Um, they had been wrong, around long enough that they were pretty well hardened by that time. No, well, they, they packed up Edward and Ice and sent them back to Manitowoc and they went on to the next flight. <laughs> they went on to Buffalo, Buffalo, New York, to the GAR encampment. Uh, this picture amazes me. This is not what I got from Lori. Look at the size of this GR within their main street. And that isn't even the top of the deck. Could be. There's a big eagle that sits way up in, up in here. That thing has got to be six, seven stories high. And if you, you can't really see it, but uh, a closer, each one of these has a picture of somebody here, here, wherever there's a picture of each individual. So they really did welcome the GAR to uh, Buffalo, New York. And they all did get back safely from Buffalo after that. But strangely, the minutes do not mention a word about Edward's fall. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Nothing is said about it. They just shoved him back and they buried him, and that was that. Now, the GAR is, is credited with establishing, back then it was Decoration Day, today we refer to it as Memorial Day. Um, it was their practice back then to bring flowers to the graves of their the fallen veterans and to their comrades who had passed away since the war. So it, it was their tradition to lead the Memorial Day parade each year. But in, in addition to that, do you want to get the next slide? In addition to that, before the, uh, the decoration of Memorial Day parade, they always got together at a local church for a church service as a body, as a body of, of, um, of men. And it didn't make any difference which church they went to. It was generally whichever church first invited them. Um, they would go to a Catholic church, a Lutheran church, uh, Episcopalian. This happened to be in 1926, the Episcopal church was the first one to send them an invitation, so they accepted it. And you know that they invited the Grand Army of the Republic, but they all, by this time they were also inviting the Spanish-American War veterans, Veterans of Foreign Wars, the American Legion, uh, pretty much any veterans that are around at that time were invited to this this church service. This picture was taken later that day after the service before the parade. This is the last known picture of the GAR as a body. I think I got this from under two again. Um, you can see by their age, by this time, that they were pretty well pretty well along. Um, our friend Anderson is still standing here. He's still alive at this point, but only for a couple more years. Um, so again, this is, what they're doing is they're standing on the east side of uh, St. James Episcopal Church. North, uh, North East Street is right in front of us. This is where this picture was taken. Uh, so again, this is the last, their last known picture that was taken as a, as a group. Dennis, what year is that? Pardon? What year was the picture? 
That was taken in, what is it, 1925? 1926. 1926. It was traditional when the member passed away that the post, uh, they did a, a resolution stating what a, what, basically what a great fellow this was. I mean, they, they tell a little bit about his military record, uh, what he did after the war, what he did with the organization and community activities. And this is a <coughs> resolution on the death of our friend Jeremiah Reardon, who died in, uh, I believe it was in the summer of 19, what they would do is they would take this resolution and then they would actually put it into the minutes. They would post it, tape it, or you glue it right into the minutes of the organization. And then they would send a copy of it to the family of the deceased to show their appreciation. Um, by 1930, Horace Walker Post had pretty much come to an end. By 1930, there's two members left. All the rest had by this time passed away. Two members that were left. This is um, Jacob Williams. He's got quite a war record. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he was a very distinguished war veteran. And he's one, again one of the last last two members of the post to survive. The next one. This is Frank Brown. Again, a very distinguished war record. And again, between him and uh, Williams, they're the last two. Now he, you can see the membership badge that he was wearing when he was given many, many years before. And he's wearing one of the ribbons. It was traditional for each post to have their own ribbon. It is unknown if Manitowoc did it. I, can, I never found anything in the minutes that indicated that they ever created a post ribbon. 99% of all the other posts did. I, I don't understand why they didn't if they didn't. But I've never seen one, and I've never, I, looking over the minutes, There's I a memoriam one to have. Pardon? There's a Walker, a Horace Walker memoriam uh, ribbon. It's got some little fringes on the bottom. It's about that size. It's a big, uh, it's got like a ceramic, like circle thing on it. That's what they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's not a historical site. I just saw it a couple weeks ago. Okay, because in the, the book on the GAR that was published a number of years ago, there is no, all the other posts have a, a photo of them, and post 18 does not have, uh, so if there is one, then that's maybe the only existing one, if that was their post ribbon, so it could have been a memorial, a memorial just put together, because they did that too. When a number of their members passed away, they would do that. They put a ribbon I don't think there was a specific name on it. Yeah, they didn't put in individual names on okay. there. Okay. Uh, there was a morning band on the sleeve there? Here's our two gentlemen standing together. You can see the flag in the background is the post GAR flag. And we're assuming when all the individual items were given, given to the historical society that that was probably, but it has since disappeared. And we don't know where it is. Some, somebody may have it somewhere, so we have no idea. And next slide. Dennis, there's a question back here. Is it on the previous slide, was he wearing a morning band on the sleeve? Uh, previous slide. That one, right here? Yeah, yeah. crease. Is yeah. that just a crease? I can't tell. It's just a crease. I think it's just a crease. Although it could have been a wine badge for his, his buddy that had passed away. Well, there's my like that. Just, just, okay, you can go forward then. Next one. Here they are sitting together. You can see it with the flag a little bit better. Do you know how old the gentlemen were when they died? They were in their 80s by that time. Mm -hmm. in, their, in their late 80s. Um, this was taken 1932, I believe, or shortly before. Uh, so assuming you know, that they were born in 1840, they would have to you know, be old enough for the war, probably in their mid to late 80s by that time. The first one to pass away was um, was Jacob Williams. He passed away on November 1st, 1932, leaving Frank Brown as the last surviving member of the post. Frank Brown passed away the following year at his daughter's home in the county. He passed away on September, September uh, 
1933. And because he was the last veteran from the city of Manitowoc and the last member of the GAR, they gave him a pretty good send-off. Mm -hmm. This is a very grainy picture from the Manitowoc Herald Times. But what they did is they put him on a, a horse-drawn caisson and took him down North A Street, then over the bridge, down uh, South A Street on his way to uh, Wesley United Methodist Church at South 9th and, and Hancock where he had his church service. There were, he was escorted by, as you can see uh, in, the, in the reading description there, from uh, veterans of the American Legion, Spanish American War, VFW, and Company E of the 127th Infantry. Uh, literally hundreds upon hundreds of spectators lined the streets to see this. In addition, they let, they let out every school in the city of Manitowoc so that the children could come and see the, the procession of the last Civil War veteran from the city of Manitowoc and the last member of the GAR. So they gave him a pretty good send off and then from there they took him on up to Evergreen Cemetery for burial. So it was a very notable, notable funeral. And again, that was taken in September of 1933. Um, after Frank Brown's death, the post had, again, had come to an end. Uh, they had their records, they had their <coughs> bags, uh, some ritual paraphernalia that they, that they had accumulated. And in their treasury, they had about $900 yet. A number of provident citizens in Manitowoc got together and decided to do something to remember the GAR as a body. So they formed a committee, and that year, 1933, they decided to put up a monument in Evergreen Cemetery in the veterans section, the veteran burial section. Uh, it was back in 1884 that the GAR had petitioned the city of Manitowoc for an area in Evergreen Cemetery for the burial of veterans that could not afford uh, a plot to, for burial. So if, you, if they couldn't afford it, they, would, they took them to this area and they buried them with military honors. So it was decided to put a monument up. Do you want to bring the next slide up? But this, they put this monument up, which was dedicated on Memorial Day in the following year, 1934. Thousands upon thousands of citizens flooded into the city of Manitowoc for the ceremony to dedicate. It was a ceremony that took almost two hours to complete, and uh, the whole area of the cemetery was just full. If you, if you do know, you know this little creature right here was the flagpole that was put in by the GAR back in the mid 1880s, where they, they flew the flag from. That is the flagpole that we, the Nantua County Civil War Roundtable, took out and put in a brand new, more eye-pleasing flag. So that was taken out and we, we paid for it. We put in a new flag right next to that monument that we, and we still take care of. I, I just put a new flag up there last week. The one that we left the old one up over the winter and that was starting to get tattered. So I went in and I took that down and put up a, a new flag. And then on Memorial Day, Rogine and I usually plant, we have a flower bed around the new flag and we go plant flowers there for that. So we're still taking care of that. So we, we have to remember that uh, GAR was an organization that established for the welfare of veterans. In other words, they were a veteran organi organization for veterans. When a veteran was impoverished, they made sure he had food on his table and that his rent was paid. When a veteran was sick, they made sure his family was taken care of. If a veteran was dying and had no family, they established a night watch to stay with him until he passed. That can be seen when in 1884, one of their members, Ephraim Johnson, passed away penniless. Members of the post purchased a coffin and a shovel, went to his house, put him in the coffin, carried him to Evergreen Cemetery, where they personally buried him, and then conducted a military service over his grave. They made sure veterans that could no longer take care of themselves could go to a veteran home, either in uh, King, the, the, the GAR post, or to Milwaukee, the soldier's home in Milwaukee. But alas, all good things have to come to an end, and the last 
GR and last Civil War veteran who passed away in the mid uh, 1950s, bringing it into one of the causes of our history that we feel to be very important. So, thank you. Dennis, did uh, previous rank in the military have any bearing in, as, in, on a post of the GAR? With no, not whatsoever. Uh, Manitowoc did have, actually have a general that was a member for a while. Um, had no, no bearing whatsoever on it. Uh, it was what, what you were when you walked in the door. What your occupation was didn't make a difference. I mean, you could be uh, a stable hand the next guy could be a vice president or president of the bank. Didn't make you all equal in the GAR. It also might be noted that the GAR was one of the few organizations that allowed colored people to be members. In addition, the state of Wisconsin had, in the whole nation, had the only all Indian post. It was up in the Menominee area. They actually had a post of completely Indians that were veterans of the Civil War. So again, everybody was equal in the, in the GAR. Uh, sorry. Well, now the, uh, there's an organization that exists today who are not reenactors, and they are sons of Union veterans. Yes. And have you passed it? Has the original GAR passed anything down to those boys? Yeah, everything. <laughs> Everyone. The sons of Union veterans. That if you're familiar with all, you, anybody can be. You have, well, I shouldn't say anybody. If you are a descendant of a Civil War veteran, you can be a member of the Sons of Union Veterans. When the last GAR members were passing away, they bequeathed everything to the Sons of Union Veterans. So actually, they own all the rights to anything GAR. Technically, we're not even supposed to have a post that, because you're not supposed to be duplicating that to nobody. Because most of us are Sons of Union Veterans, and we're following your edict of keeping the memory of the GAR alive, nobody has challenged us yet. So that's why we're still doing it, because I, I am a member of the Sons of Union Veterans. Yeah, that's right. I don't want to give away any secrets, but what was the point, what were some of these secret hand signals, or what was the point of the secret hand signals? Yeah, nobody didn't let that secret out, though. <laughs> <laughs> nobody knows what they are. <clears throat> the secret passwords were, if you were gonna come to a meeting, Nas their national GAR issued a password every month. And you had to know what that password is to get into the meeting. So when you came to the door by the guard, which led you in, you had to give them the password. If you didn't know what the password was, you had to go through a rigmarole, rigmarole of the sergeant of arms coming out and verifying, yes, he is a member, he can come in, and then they chewed you out for not knowing the password. <laughs> uh, Many groups had ritual signs, and uh, uh, Masons were famous for that, for uh, giving, to let another Mason know that they were a Mason without actually saying I'm a Mason. There were signs, there were handshakes in a certain, instead of three fingers, you might shake like this to indicate that, that you're a member of that organization. And if the guy didn't return that, you knew he wasn't a member of it. So. Yeah, they did have, but for the most part, they succeeded in keeping their rituals and practices. Although in, in my book there, I do have a big area of rituals and practices. It, Were there groups exclusive to say cavalry or artillery or navy? No, did not make any difference which branch of service you, you were in. Didn't make any difference if you served for three months or you served for four years. They could care, they cared less if you were, in fact, I don't even think they probably didn't even talk about it. Because it didn't, you know, unless you were, had one of your, your buddies was in the same company that you were, you might have talked about some experiences that you had in service. They did have reunions, you know, regimental reunions. Uh, Manitowoc had a, a several uh, reunions of the 9th Wisconsin, the German regiment here, and the GAR participated in that but not, uh, they didn't mention it, they just helped out with it because there were, had been a lot of members of the Knights that were members of the local GAR. But it didn't make any difference. Yeah. 
with the uh, ultimate success of the DAR, isn't it kind of surprising <coughs> that uh, the first attempt, for example, with Bolt 38 was, was unsuccessful? Do you know any more about, uh, you know, the Carnhouse said there was political strife or something like that? You know anything more about that story? Well, other than the Republicans were that got in there, I mean, were pretty much the commanding the commanders, the, the junior vice commanders, senior vice commanders were mostly all Republicans. So they, when an election would come up, they would be pushing Republican candidates, and um, that was not well appreciated if you were a Democrat or if you were a Whig or whatever <laughs> political party you belonged to. You didn't. You know, you didn't want to be told who to have to vote for. Although, strangely, after the, the second birth of the GAR, they did a lot of that. They, they pretty much, because by that time, most of the uh, politicians that they were pushing were actually Civil War veterans. The GAR succeeded in electing five men that President of the United States that were Civil War veterans. And they got a lot of legislation through because of that. Most of the veterans' benefits that we have today that I enjoy were uh, brought forth by the Grand Army Republic. They're the ones that initiated pensions, uh, health benefits, uh, just a, uh, benefits for the wife after the husband died. I mean, just um, benefit after benefit was. Uh, I don't. I don't remember the figure anymore. But I read one time around the turn of the century where over half of the U.S. budget was paying veterans benefits. And that could very well be. They started out around $12, $13 a month, but then as time went on, their, their retirement or benefits that they received as a veteran increased. Uh, the original veterans, you had to be disabled to get a pension. You know, if you lost an arm, you lost a leg, or from there it went on to, okay, I, I, I contracted um, you know, malaria, I contracted some other disease that had making, you know, I can't do my job now because of that, so I, I deserve a pension. And after a while, they started giving pensions to these guys. And I think eventually at the end, they, anybody that life was getting a pension. And when they passed away, that pension went on to their wife. I don't know if it was the full amount or not, but the wife also got a pension after the husband passed away. Right. From my study of my ancestors, it started out at eight dollars, and then it was moved to ten, and to twelve, and by 1919, my great grandmother was receiving twenty-five dollars. Mm -hmm. So that's what it went in that time period. But you know, it's like, like you said, half the budget was being used at a period of time. But as you got to appreciate it, as time went on, veterans started dying. So that, you know, while the amount went up, the amount that they were, the number of men that they were paying uh, decreased, unless the wife was still living, you know, at that point. Of That's Wasn't there a period of time in the late 1880s, 1890s, where all these old veterans were? Marrying all these young women because the young women were after them just for the pension? Well, that's a good story. Oh. You know, yeah. Yes, it is. We'll go to next frame. Or the one more. No, what we have the next. Back? Back. Yeah. Right here. This is exactly what you're talking about. The arm around, uh, around this gentleman here is his daughter, young daughter. He was married when he was in his 80s and had, had a daughter. His wife, again, he married a young, a young lady who was still able, you know, and he was still able to father children <coughs> in his 80s. Yeah. So he, uh, that's his, I don't have her included in the picture, but she's a young girl, maybe 16 at the time, 15, 16. And he's in his 90s, late 90s by this time. So that's exactly what you're talking about. Yes, they, they did marry later in life, a lot of them, and had children. And uh, generally, the children did not get benefits, so I mean, the, the, the wives did. But yeah, a lot of them. And we, we still use that term. When we go to reenactments now, we might be sitting around, and some pretty girls walk 
buy up and you know, go and say, I get a pension. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Whether they purchase them or not, yeah, but we still we, we still use that because that was true. They didn't do that. Because yeah. Well, I was just going to ask, um, you said that all the GAR posts were uh, primarily named after one of the leaders or whatever. Did Horace Walker have any competition, or was it unanimous to name the Manitowoc uh, GAR post after him? I think or, with James Anderson, who had served under him, it was okay. pretty well, because there, they, at that particular time, about uh, six or seven of the original 22 were members of Company A of Wisconsin. So they pretty well pushed that through. I don't. I doubt there might have been somebody else nominated, but they pretty well. The company A guys pretty well pushed that through for him. And according to what you're saying here in the Young Wives, there are still a number of real daughters of Union veterans because they belong to the daughters of Union veterans of the Civil War. And in our newsletter, periodically they mention some of the ladies who are real daughters. A dozen of them are still alive. Who was the guy that? Uh, Joe Humble. Bill Humble. Yes. I mean, yes. met a number of. He yes. was the son of a Civil War veteran. Yes. I met him a number of times at reenactments and at their. Uh, and I don't, if you tell the story, or Don tells the story that when uh, I've been talking to somebody and they, you know, he, he was in his 90s, I guess. I mean, so he was he was born in. He had to have been born in like the. I thought his dad was 84 or something like. that. Yeah, and he, he, he looks at him and he says, yeah, I'm old. He said, but you should meet my younger brother. <laughs> <laughs> His father had children after him yet, and he was, the two of them were still alive. Four, four years younger. Yeah. Yeah, William, William uh, was born when his dad was 72, and his brother when his dad was 76. Okay. And wow. his brother still may be alive Yeah, we don't know if he's Colorado. alive or not yet. Uh, but William tells the story, or has told the story of when he would sit on his father's, his father had been shot in the, in the chest, and he had a huge hole in his, it was embedded uh, deep into his, his, William would put his head in that, in that hole when his father would hold him. And he survived the, should not have survived the war, but he did, and his father it's showed him his it's, eight, eight, eight years. It's because, he says it's because they didn't send him to any of those. <coughs> My grandmother was the daughter of a Civil War veteran, oh, really? and she she ended up living at King and died there. And when I was born, I looked in my scrapbook. There's a gift in there, and she'd written from Mrs. So and So, a little old Civil War veteran's wife. Okay. It was a knitted something or other for me as a baby, which I wish I still had. Wow. <laughs> I picked up some uh, Sears catalog reproduction, and they had like. And hats, stuff all related to the GAR. Mm -hmm. Couple of them. Yeah, from Sears. Yeah. From Sears, mm -hmm. yeah. I, okay. I didn't so think that. Then you have in your hat. I wouldn't think they could be authorized to to do that because the badge that I'm wearing, the, the membership badge, uh, there was <coughs> a law passed by Congress that you had to be a member of the GAR to wear this badge. If you were caught wearing it and you were not a member, you could be fined twenty-five dollars <coughs> and spend up to twenty-five days in jail. Mm -hmm. So they were very protective of their of their badges and their paraphernalia. And is there some significance to numbering on these badges? I don't recall what it is. Do you know the details? Uh, yeah, they, they do come in a specific order. Like when they were issued, wasn't it? Yeah, something when they were issued. Uh, some are more valuable than others because of that. They're classified in. Uh, if you, if you look on eBay and you're looking for a specific badge that was made, you know, within a certain, certain years, they're numbered uh, for that. Any other questions? How do you tell the people about some of those things out of your collar? Your thing on the collar is. Mm -hmm. Which one? Well, that's a star. That's our old unit that we kind of disbanded to become GAR. That's a badge of the. Star of the Third Wisconsin, and the other badge that I'm wearing over here is the uh, Milwaukee Veterans Home badge. When they became a member of, or went to the Veterans Home in Milwaukee, they were given this, and they protected this puppy with their lives because that was their meal ticket. When they went into 
for their three meals a day, they had to have this badge showing when they walked in. Otherwise, they would boot it out and send it out to the office to get a, get a different one. So if they lost it, they were in trouble. So that's that's the badge that, uh, these are reproductions. These, I bought these from the veterans home, but they were, they were reproducing them for sale. I've never seen an original one. I imagine that's quite valuable. Any other? So the rest of the other badges I'm wearing, some of these are state, state badges. This one is a 1912, this is very rare. There's only three of these that I know of. This is a, what they call the arch badge. When they dedicated the arch at Camp Randall in 1912, they, they produced this badge for the state encampment that year. Um, 100 years later, we went down there to rededicate the arch in 2012. And I'm standing in line and the director of the uh, Wisconsin Veterans Museum was standing around talking to some of the guys and he comes over by me and we're talking. I said, well, where's your arch badge? What, what are you talking about, arch badge? Well, it's just this. And I showed him that because there's an arch on there with the date 1912, Madison, Wisconsin. He looked at it, he had never seen one before. Mm -hmm. He got so excited, he called his guys over there, were taking pictures of it. Where can we get one? I'm sorry, I've only seen two other badges like that. So I've oh, seen two. You've seen two of them? Yeah, one is uh, the Cross and Antique Store, one is Cedar Bird, you guys. Okay. Mm -hmm. Somebody muffed up really bad on this one because I bought this off eBay for like $20. Mm -hmm. People were not watching that Sunday afternoon when that thing came up for sale <laughs> because those things are, these are priceless. I mean, they're, 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 Peterbrook wanted more than 20 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Don's got a ribbon. One of the last, it was, I think, from the last GAR encampment, mm -hmm. national encampment, uh, because there were so few members left at that time, they only made a couple of them. I think that it's worth a couple thousand dollars, oh. and that's just a ribbon from the GAR, but it's the last, the last encampment ribbon. Yeah, I got a pin from Oshkosh, but I think it was out of the 30. Yeah, you can you can pick them some of the stuff up fairly easily. Yeah, yeah, one from the um, Oshkosh from I think called the Hicks Monument right by the Grand Theater. They had, mm -hmm. I think it was, I remember it's 1907, and I was doing reenacting in 1963, mm -hmm. and I was over at my grandmother's house in Berlin because we were doing a parade from the uh, Second Wisconsin, and some woman walked up. My grandmother was telling about it. She said, "Well, this has been in the family. You can have it." She gave it to me. Oh. <laughs> There's some good books out on the GAR. Um, just recently, um, what's the name of them? Pat, Pat and Pat. Oh, Lindsay? Lindsay. Pat Lynch, she wrote a book on the uh, GAR home in Milwaukee. Very, very good book. And there was another one that was written by a young lady called Out at the Soldier's Home. And a phenomenal book, but that was written back probably about 1910. And I've read it like three or four times because there's a lot of information in that. And then recently somebody published a book on Kim Veterans Home. That's another one. So if you have any interest in the Veterans Home,